50 minutes. As nearby as the arcades of Akihabara and as far as the playgrounds of Europe. As the Final Fantasy series has moved from numeral to numeral, there have been high points and low. But with each new game comes the promise of a new story, a new myth. The story of what happened with Final Fantasy XIV is one such myth. What we know about it comes from old reviews, archived message board threads, and through conversations with those who were there. The reason for this is that the original version of Final Fantasy XIV doesn't exist anymore. Unlike the vast majority of other old games, there is no way of playing it. It was redacted, painted over. Where once stood a game that threatened to sink the Final Fantasy brand forever, now stands the second most popular subscription MMO in the world. And as the years pass us, the myth of that original version <laughs> and its incredible redemption story are at risk of disappearing. How did it all happen? How did the same studio that shipped a broken mess turn it all around in two years? Why did they make the decision to keep the old version still alive while secretly Secretly working on a brand new game. And how did they manage to make all of this, the redesign and rebirth, part of the game's lore? Sorry, we knew this was a Caroline. story worth telling, not only for those who were there to see it all go down, but for the millions of you who have never heard about this, who never knew the extraordinary lengths the development team went to to save this game. So we did just that. Pack your bags, friends. No clip is heading to Tokyo. We've got Zip. Hello and welcome to Shinjuku, Tokyo, home of Godzilla, restaurants full of dancing robots, and Square Enix, one of the most prolific video game companies in the world. For the past few months I've been playing catch up with this story, playing the latest version of the game, talking to players, and watching community retrospective series like the Speakers Network's fantastic fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV. My goal, to make sure we asked the right questions when we sat down with the team. During our time here in Shinjuku, we're going to talk to everyone from the engineers who worked on the original game, to localization leads, community managers, and even the CEO of the company. All to allow them the opportunity to tell their side of this fascinating story. The fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV happened in real time in front of millions of people around the world. But we wanted to know about this story from an entirely new perspective, from inside the corporate machine that made it happen, that led to its terrible launch and ultimately its incredible rebirth. A Realm Reborn. My name is uh, Michael Christopher Koji Fonx. Um, I am the English localization lead for Final Fantasy XIV. And my middle name being Koji, it's not something I gave myself, it's a, a name my father gave me. My father was stationed uh, in Japan for two years in the Navy when he was young. Went back to the States. My mom had me. Um, they wanted to give me a Japanese name. The family was having none of that, <laughs> so they kind of snuck that it in the middle the name. First. But then they always parts, called me you know Koji. That, right? And right. so I guess the, go you know, the joke was on the rest of the family. You know, My dad being in the Navy, did you really set? learn a lot about Japan so other than three here. parts. You might want to do the hierarchy first. This is almost two and a half hours. This is three parts? Yeah. Really like Japan, but didn't learn. Holy nutsack. I might want to watch that one on my own then. Explain it's each worse social I'm sure group it is, of player. But do you guys want to sit here for an hour and a half with just me doing that? From the... Yes, you guys want to? You guys want to sit here for an hour and a half with me. All right, hierarchy gets put off to the side learn any of the language, so I always knew that my name was Japanese, but beyond that, I really didn't know anything about Japan. But there was always that little seed in there. And then when I got into high school, there's a Japanese class, and I like games. Oh, they make games in Japan. Hey, let me study Japanese. If I study Japanese, I can play all those cool Japanese games that, I, that never come out over in America. And it kind of just snowballed from there. Uh, when I graduated from high school, um, I took a trip to Japan for three weeks, homestay type of thing, and I fell in love with it. And during that period, I got to visit a lot of schools um, and a lot of English classes in those schools. And I thought, wow, I could probably do, I know English, I could do this, this'll be easy. Uh, uh. Um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but I studied a couple years at a, at a university in America, then transferred over to Japan, started over four years at a university in Japan. Wow. Got my teaching license and uh, yeah, it's hard work being a teacher. Yes, I, I mean, I loved it, but I mean, it was very draining. And that's why pretty much after you'd go to school six in the morning for morning basketball practice, because I was the basketball coach, because that's my principal said, hey, you're tall, you're the basketball coach. Then you'd get into classes. I mean, I'd have my homeroom class, then I'd have you know six or seven other classes. This teaching. guy's your basketball you coach. After school, all of a sudden it's, oh, there's after school basketball. And then you'd get home and you'd correct 
So I was really, you know, always at school every day. It was very draining, and I would go home and <laughs> I would play FF11. It was how I was able to relax and being able to go into my little room, what and ninja plays, and put on my headphones and you know get into that world of Vanity. You don't understand that some some escape. The community from loves the this game. And my suggestion: be, you know, the one hierarchy day I was video, online, then the you know, checking for Love you 11 chat. related information, and I saw that Square Enix was hiring, looking for a translator, and it just kind we of can do it backwards. Wow, that would be really cool. We could skim this too. You know what I'm saying? Watch this. His first MMO, the early days Ten of online. Gone. Many of the team who worked on 14 started on 11. One of those was Kasuga-san, who joined the company in 1999 to build the network infrastructure for this fledgling MMO. なので一番最初にやっていたのが、ま、当時プレイステーション 今、ADSL の認証として使われたPPPOE of course, online connectivity was available through the Dreamcast, but for the PlayStation platform, it was the first time they were implementing the online element. So, it was online the PlayStation 2 network was TCPIP's driver was created, and it was the first time they were implementing the ADSLが正直 いろんなことがありましたね、当時ね。こんな言っちゃっていいのかな。言っちゃっていいの。オッケーなのあ、いいんだ。え、まずね、どういうことなんだかというと、うん、まあ、あの時はあの、MMO とかね、海外だったらウ
everyone, every single one is shopping around. It. So yeah, that's a huge difference. <laughs> in, the world, in the West, you, know, you have your EverQuests and you have your Ultima Onlines. In Japan, there was none of that. And then, so Final Fantasy XI was really one All of the first. All Rise of Final Fantasy XIV is better. I know, it's a fun Japan. one though. I want to look at so serious. Getting to work with basically the pioneer of, of the Japanese see. MMO um, was really exciting. On the other hand, I mean, you could also say that it was possibly kind of a curse in the sense that um, they were all, you know, doing their own thing. They had their vision better. of what yeah. an MMO should be and what a Japanese MMO should be. Um, and then me, again, not having played an MMO before, getting on this team and thinking, okay, this is an MMO and translating That's away and working on that project, I kind of mixer, you know, started thinking, okay, this is what an MMO is, this is what an MMO is. And then that one day I start playing WoW and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> seeing the differences between the two and saying like, okay, what I thought was the norm in Final Fantasy XI, you know, the grinding for 20 hours to go up one level and then only to have your level drop when you, you know, That's crazy, pull too by many the crabs way. and it kills you and you've lost five hours of work. Like, I thought that was normal. And then you're like, well, that's not normal, is it? That's Japanese, some uh, uh, base game, um, Final Fantasy What game did that as well? The other one, they were um, working on the first expansion pack, uh, Rise of the Zalart. I was part I of the this team that name. was working to get um, the base game and Rise of Zalart all translated before um, the Japanese Rise of Zalart was finished, too, so we could all release at the same time. Right. Did you get it on time? I got it on time. Okay. I, haven't missed, I haven't missed a deadline yet. That's, that's one thing I'm proud of. Final Fantasy XI was a huge success for Square Enix. It established a concurrent user base of around a quarter of a million players for years. It was the most profitable Final Fantasy game ever, and at one stage was the sixth most popular game on all of Xbox Live. More than that, it established the Japanese style of MMO. And when the decision was made in 2005 to start work on a sequel, the new MMO was built around things that made Eleven successful, focusing, like most Final Fantasy games do, on beautiful graphics and an interesting battle system. This new game was to be directed and produced by the same duo that shipped Eleven, series veteran Hiromishi Tanaka and Nobuaki Komodo. Final Fantasy XIV was announced for Windows and PlayStation 3 in 2009, but behind the scenes, the development team was struggling to put the pieces of its new world together. Oh, shit. Oh. Well, Final Fantasy XIV, the first version of the first version, the most important problem for me was the most important problem for me. The first concept of the first version of the first version was the planner and script to be written by the game to create a game. でまあ、利点としては、まあ、プランナーが考えて自分たちで実装するんでと高速な開発ができる要はとそうじゃないと基本的にはプランナーさんものを考えてと開発者にとエンジニアに相談してどう実装するかを決めてで、まあ、ゲームデザインをする人はそのどういうパラメータをいじりたいかとか相談しながら。エンジニアと話をしてものを作っていかなきゃいけないんですけれども、uh, no, yet, ああそこの部分に関してスクリプトを導入すると自分で考えて自分で実現することができるようになるっていう発想でとゲーム実装の大半がスクリプトで組まれてたんですね。Yeah. そのスクリプト UI の問題もそうなんですけれどもゲームも UI も基本的にはスクリプトで書かれていてでス,スクリプトを動かすエンジン側がかなりと負荷が高いというか。CPU をたくさん使わないと動かない状態になっているので、まあ、ち,ょっとちょっとした何かをするだけでもゲーム内で少し何かをするだけでも、うん、非常に CPU リソースを使うことになっていて、まあ、すぐにこうサーバーが回るサイクルが遅くなっていくっていうことが問題として発生していましたで結果としてそのサーバーでできることは少ないあとゲームとしてサーバーで実現できるところは少ないですしと。何かしようとすると負荷が上がっちゃうんでじゃあそれを回避するためにどうしようとかっていうことで結果的にそのゲーム内容としてリッチなものが実現できなくなっているってことが起きましたねで UI もスクリプトで組まれていたのでまあなんかちょっと処理するだけでもすごい時間がかかるっていうような問題が発生していました Basically the too long didn't read version of what he said is like something along the lines of their scripts sucked huge wiener So whenever they tried to execute things on those scripts, it would just lag their whole world and just be very unstable, essentially. Like I mentioned before, again, localization just shitty coding, a essentially, where we get to see all the parts come together first. We were some of the first to realize that, you know, Houston, we have a problem. 
uh, that type of situation. I mean, you know, you had the battle team. They're like, yes, we have this great battle system, you know, with stamina and these things that you could do. And then you had the story team. Like, yes, we have this story. Oh, hey, we have these guild leaves and all of these parts. And everyone was really, really proud of their parts. You know, look at this grass. It's so beautiful. Look at this barrel. It's the you know the most beautiful barrel ever to be you know represented in graphical <laughs> form. It's got and, as many polygons as a character. Yes, <laughs> and all of those parts, you know, all of these teams, again, very, very proud of their work. I mean, you have the team was, you know, put together um, with some of the best minds in Square Enix. You had people that were, you know, leads that could probably even, you know, create lead their own projects. Were all come together and. It became a lot of just tiny little groups making something that was really great. But once you put it together, it was kind of a mess. And no one really knew that, except for localization and probably QA as well. And we were like, OK, we need to do something. But by then, it was one of those, it's kind of too late to do anything. But for us, we would we would be looking at the text. And some of it, you know, it wouldn't make sense, or it would just be very bland and thinking, if there's any way to make this game better, what can we do? It's like, well, I can take this text and maybe add some more stuff into it, add some more flavor to it, and you know, maybe that will uh, oh, distract man. people from the fact that the battle <laughs> is not that fun. Oh, or, at a fundamental level, the piecemeal design of that the game sucks, was causing dude. problems. Graphics were inconsistent. While many elements of the world were copy and pasted ad nauseum, some environmental objects had as many polygons and shaders as a character model. The battle system was just confusing. The game didn't have elements fundamental to most modern MMOs, things like jumping, auto attack, and the ability to interact with the map using a mouse. It had a Yo, system that nerfed hardcore players to make sure they didn't level well, up too fast. The UI was confusing, the crafting was incredibly story, complex and to took forever, and simply Ten there just wasn't enough free. content. The closed beta wasn't going well. They needed more time to... It had a system like jump... Hold on. I just downloaded this game knowing damn well uh, get about 15 minutes past the booba creation and into the story just to be confused 10 out of 10 mind yeah you, know, you don't need to get too crazy into the story though you can like catch yourself up on youtube videos, videos later architects if you really really wanted it you know what i'm saying thing auto attack and the ability to interact with the map using a mouse it had a system that nerfed hardcore players to make sure they didn't level up too fast the ui was confusing crafting was incredibly complex and took forever and simply, there just wasn't enough content. The closed beta wasn't going well. They needed more time to fix these problems, so the open beta was pushed back to within a month before launch. The team knew there were problems, and they were getting frustrated. ま、みんなに認識されて自覚さ、されていくっていうのは結構ベータが始まって製品版が始まってっていう、ま、8月9月、10月ぐらいまでの期間に起きたことなんですね。で、と、実際にはリリース、こう、チーム内の意識としても
Anyone else heard of Cyberpunk? He just got so frustrated. He just wrote Never. this scathing mail and sent it out to the whole team before telling anyone else on localization he was going to write it. And then we all get it at the same time, the devs team. We're reading, it's like, wow, this is really terrible. I hope he doesn't, oh, he sent it to the whole team. <laughs> because he just got really frustrated right. because he could, to him, I mean, they were being very stubborn. They weren't, um, you know, they hadn't moved on. Whereas the rest of the world had moved on and, and adapted, um, you know, with the release of WoW and, and what they had done. Whereas, you know, the team here was like, no, we're gonna stick with what we know and that's good enough. Then start feeling more about, more concerning the situation. I mean, this is not fixed, not fixed, not fixed. Oh, then, oh, you, announced the launch date, oh, yeah, but it's not fixed. Yeah. So, yeah, but still, the some major portion people are still thinking, still be, uh, believing, mm. oh, no, no, it's, it's better, still better. better phase, last phase, but still better. So it could be, I mean, uh, fixed or the change at the launch timing. Yeah. So. Kind oh. of went from the excuse thinking, of okay, it's this just it's gonna still be great beta, to, you know? uh oh, there might be some be problems. Can we, get, can we fix them? Can we fix them? Okay, we can't fix them. Is there anything we can do? Uh, I don't know. It was, yeah. Damn, that's a lot of pressure. It was man. a very taxing experience. The team crossed their fingers and hoped that the game's beta problems were simply that, the same issues that most MMOs have, ones that could be fixed with patches once the game entered live operations. And so Final Fantasy XIV Online launched on September 30th, 2010. It sold well its first week and after a month had over 600,000 players swarming into its world but it didn't take long for the cracks to appear. The problems in the beta were echoed by new players. The game was sluggish, the servers crashed, and the Orzeans quickly ran out of things to do. Quests were limited and the fatigue system even made grinding for XP next to impossible. Critics ate it alive too. Fatigue let's system. get right down to it. So unless the you've got the patience exactly? of Job or some kind of masochist, you shouldn't play Final Fantasy XIV. Its problems are so vast that I could spend hours talking about them. The awful interface, the recycled content, the stringent limits on questing, the useless maps, the stupid market ward, these issues and dozens more constantly have you asking that age-old question, what were they thinking? So what was it like seeing public reaction? Yeah, it was, it was very, I mean, very disheartening um, because you know, you'd want to you'd want to look at those and you'd want to say, no, no, they don't understand. They don't know, you know, what's going on here, or, or you know, but deep down, you'd know they were right, and that was what kind of you know, that dagger in your heart and it's twisty because, you know, you want to defend what you worked on. I mean, the people that I worked with are the greatest people. They're, I mean, I still, you know, work with a lot of them. I had worked with them before in FF11. I consider them not only coworkers but friends, um, but. You know, and then you see people on, online, you know, bashing the work they did. And I know how hard they worked. I know how many hours they put in. I know that like in the last three or four months, people were basically living um, at work, all putting their 100% into this game that was, you know, destined to <laughs> kind of crash and burn. But, and then to have people online just say, oh, that sucks. This person is a piece of shit and their work is terrible. It. It hurts, but it hurts more because if I was not here and was a user and had played that game, I probably would have said the same thing. So, so 11 was received well even when it had problems, but 14 uh, did not, obviously. So people liked the overall game, even if there were like bugs and shit at the beginning, it was well received. People didn't like the game on 1.0. So it was それはそうですね。ま、ロンチして、ま、しばらく経って、ま、そんなにない時間じゃなかったですね。そう、しばらくなんで、やっぱり相当なあの
There was concern about whether I mean, they the could continue. Months, it was just a, an endless stream of translating apology mails from you know producers and directors and and you know finding out, um, trying to figure out different ways of saying we're sorry, um, because the more you say it, the less weight it has. But Japan, being a very or a company or a country where you know people apologize a lot, that's part of the culture. But then trying to translate that, it's like, okay, this is the tenth time I've said sorry in this one post, and then from you know the American myself, it's like, yeah, people are going to look at that as insincere. You know, the more you apologize, the more insincere. And then trying to explain that to the team, it's like, no, we have to apologize. It's like, yes, you have to apologize. But and it just became we weren't talking about the game anymore. We were talking about how to translate apologies, and it seemed like that lasted for you know a couple months. Actually, we see a huge drop. I mean, after right after the launching, launch timing, we got a. Uh, some I mean, good number of the subscribers again that fall fall I mean as you can imagine so I mean it was failure and we announced a failure so we see uh, lots of decline. ただ ま、まだ世に出せる。世に出せる効率に達してない商品を出してしまったっていう気持ちはみんなにあったんで、実際にその改善しなきゃっていうか、こう根本的に対応しなきゃいけないっていうところは、と、チームに割とすぐ広がった
初めて MMO をプレイした作品でやっぱり同じようなその3回目の衝撃 3,000 人が同時に一つの世界で遊ぶっていうのがもうとてつもないまた衝撃でした、ね、まあウルティマは本当に自由度のウルティマオンラインは特にとにかく初期は自由度がめちゃくちゃ高いゲームだったのでそのいわゆるロードの称号をつけたそのなんて言ったらいいんだろうなすごく紳士的なというかコミュニティリーダー的プレイをするキャラクターと。完全に悪のプレイヤーキラーをやるキャラクターを作ってどっちもものすごい遊んでたしやっぱりその MMORPG というゲームがどう作られてるのかどういったエンジニアリングが必要なのかっていうのもものすごいそこで勉強させてもらったと思いますもうその頃からはコンソールと同じぐらいの比重で PC でゲームをかなり遊ぶようになってたので自分で PC パーツ買ってきて組み立てたりしてたしでやっぱりそのあたりで FPS もかなりプレイし始めてたし特に 3DMMO のスタートであるエバクエストその後プレイし始めて当時エバクエストのパッケージを日本で手に入れるのが本当に大変で出張で東京に来た時に秋葉原をね時間を作ってゾンビのように店をこううろうろして。エバークエストってゲームないですかエバークエストってないですかって。ユシダさんは、ゲームを作るのを見つけたのに、Square Enix に参加する Dragon Quest シリーズ。でも、彼は、Final Fantasy のファイナルファンタジーチーム、彼は、Part of the Umbrella Group、が、Allocating Programmers to various projects。彼は、Granular Visibility on FF14、but he knew the team was struggling. I asked from his perspective as a producer where he thought the game's problems were coming from. I don't know, I'm going to cut it off, but Crystal Tools is a middleware that 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 is a middleware. になってしまったので、どのプロジェクトもものすごい大変な時期だった。オリジナルの14がああなったってしまった理由の一つでもあるかなと。さらに2つ大きな問題がそこに絡まっていて、スクエアニックスの全体にプレイステーション2のジェネレーションで本当に世界一クオリティ、グラフィックスのクオリティが高い。そしてゲームエクスペリエンスがものすごく詰まったゲームというのをたくさんリリースしたので本当にこうなんて言うんだろうある意味自信過剰にもうなっていた時期で自分たちが世界一だし自分たちのグラフィックスこそが世界一だしその作り方はその自分たちにしかできないだからなんだろうでもスターは We had the extraneous、uh, sort of confidence that, oh, we have the world's、uh, number one graphics and only we're able to accomplish that kind of quality. So they thought they were only the ones that could handle business. So they thought they were only the ones that could handle business. So they thought they were only the ones that could handle business. So they thought t h e 例えるとその刀を作る刀匠のような職人たちが本当にたくさんいて彼らが一つずつを手作りで作って世界一のクオリティを作り上げていたんだけど実は世界はまあ特にその北米を中心にテクノロジーでそれをカバーするっていうところをずっと追求してきた時期でそれをカバーするっていうところをずっと追求してきた時期でプレイステーション3の世代になった瞬間にテクノロジーの方がそれを上回るっていう時期で作成で作り方を変えようとはしないしだけどテクノロジーも追いつけないっていうことからさらにそれを知ってるはずのプログラマーたちはミドルウェアの制作に行っている状態で。That we had an issue that we needed to catch up. Technology wise, we were wrapped up in creating middleware. 
アーティストたちが自分たちの thinking ものすごく負荷のかかるやり方で作り方アーティストたちは自分たちの作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を作り方を いかなる時でもとても大切なものだとは思うんですけどそこにやっぱり超巨大な成功体験をしたっていうこと自体が乗っかってきちゃうと。Uh, they started to think that because they were so great, they didn't need to like fetch info from other games or any of that shit. They were just, we got the best. 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 If you ask a hundred people, I'm sure a hundred people would say World of Warcraft. Do the staff members play it for Warcraft? No. None of the people were familiar with that game. Oh no. So I gave that example of World of Warcraft, not because I wanted to talk about whether or not the devs knew World of Warcraft or not, but I just wanted to point out that we need to look at what will be our rival. What will be our rival? And what users are experiencing in terms of the latest gameplay experiences. Game Actually, you gotta do your research, right? Why would you not want to research? You're gonna jump hundreds of thousands of millions. I felt it was unbe、uh, unbelievable that no one was doing that research for titles outside of your own. Because, because you won't know where you are unless you look at other games. Even with online games. Final Fantasy XI, of course, there was a great success on that title as well because that was actually based on a lot of the developers looking at EverQuest. They thought they really looked at it, studied it, played it. They applied that sort of knowledge in order to make XI such a great game. It's like if you're trying to open a new restaurant when you go in and do absolutely no research on the surrounding competitors, open a new restaurant. restaurant right? yeah. And、um, so, just at the, the launch stage then of, of 1.0, what was the feeling within Square Enix? The beta was quite close to launch. Were people anticipating that there would be negative feedback? Were people quite close to launch? Were people anticipating that there would be negative feedback? Or were they less aware that that was going to happen? I guess. Yo, Kraus, thanks for the 100 bits. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I was on a different team, of course, but I was reading up on the internet that the response to the beta was poor. I mean, at that time, of course, whenever an MMO launches, I know the internet tends to get up in arms and they try to complain about it. The development team does not does do service test, but of course, the player wants to play it as soon as they can. Same monsters we see. I know those guys. I wasn't、uh, involved in the team, so I was looking at it from the outside perspective. But I was thinking that because it's the same team who worked on 11, so I thought it was just the consumers comparing it to the high level of completion of FF11. And so I thought eventually that sort of animosity would die down. But coming from an insider perspective, there were apparently a number of people within the original development team. So, the stand to stay was, this is not going to be easy. More time to get the hints to get it. That thought, if we continued moving forward, we were in a very bad situation. Square Enix had turned around and told those people that, well, that's how it was for Final Fantasy XI's launch. We had missing functions that were a lot of negative feedback, but we were able to patch it up and fix it. So the company decided to conclude the beta phase and then go into launch. This information that I found out when I talked with and interviewed with some of the development staff members after I joined the project. Team の中ではやっぱり議論はあったそうです。あのままじゃダメ、まずいっていう話も。
ただ最終的なジャッジは今今の話した通り、イレブンの時もそうだった。でもイレブンだってずっとパッチを続けて、ああなったじゃないか。もしかしたら、チョイスは捨てられた。最終的にコーポレーターは、これは不可能なことだったので、そこで、それを考えたメンバーの一人のチームに作成したタスクフォース。このタスクフォースは、リサーチを進めることができないので、そのリソースを、デベロップメントに必要なことを作る。Members of that team would talk to Yoshida san about their worries after hours. His thoughts were that the current organizational structure would need to be modified if the team was going to make the changes required. In October of 2010, Yoshida san talked to the then Square Enix president Yoichi Wada and suggested they initiate a company wide emergency to get the team the resources they needed. Wada san spent a few emergency. days talking to the 14 development team about their concerns. I mean, and while a lot of the team had suggested that the current task force was, in fact, up to the task, Some members of the 14 suggested that the current task force was, in fact, up to the task. Some members of the 14 team had pleaded to have Yoshida san join the project to help. And so it transpired that in late November, corporate took the decision to remove Hiromishi Tanaka from the team and move Nobuaki Komodo from director <coughs> to lead designer. Both of their vacant positions would be filled by Yoshida san. At that time, he was leading a team that was working on an original IP for Square Enix. He was disappointed to leave that team, but excited for the opportunity to work on one of the company's crown jewels, a numbered Final Fantasy game. So, he got right to work. So I believe there are three major points that I had to accomplish with this sort of transition, of course. まずそのチームに、トップが変わります。で、あとそのタスクフォースメンバーもそのまま開発コアとして、今、sort of like、の前半の話をしなきゃいけない全チーム。ただ僕はドラゴンクエスト側のゲームを開発することが多かったので、ほとんどのスタッフを知らないというか、まあ、顔と名前ぐらいは知ってるスタッフはいたけど、その一緒に仕事したことがある人がほとんどいなかったので、まず、セイハローっていうところから。で、自分はみんな仕事したことがないから、どんな仕事をする人間なのかを見てくれればいい。Like、do, で、あ、こいつダメだと思ったら、あのチームを抜けて構わないからっていう話を最初にして、一緒に仕事してみようでも一回、一回はいいよね。で、それでダメだと思ったら、本当すぐ抜けて構わないから、三ヶ月ぐらいまず一緒にやろうという話をスピーチでした記憶があります。キングシェディ。で、まあ。I did mention to them that we were going to take this challenge on one more time. At that time, we didn't have any plans of a rough reform, but I did communicate that we're not going to give up on this project and we're still going to push through. So there were people who already knew me and they would be just as encouraged, like, oh yes, I'm going to go and do this. And some people reacted like, this is, the, this is impossible, you're putting too much on us, or some people just got frustrated because they did not like what was going on. So I think that was like the kind of the general reaction that I got. Yeah, dude, he is in the most impossible situation. He's a team member on the 14th Sound team, even now. Masayoshi、uh, was there when I did this speech in the large hall to the development team. And also, I was in charge of adjusting And also, I was in charge of adjusting my microphone there, and、uh, when I delivered that speech, he was the only one I can still clearly remember. He was like, Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I saw both reactions. I saw the, Oh my God, we just went through a year of hell, and now he's asking us to go through a year and a half of hell to this point that might you know, be another failure because you know, no one had taken a game and rebuilt it. In, in this manner before. So basically, he's saying, like, yeah, you just have to trust me, and yeah, you could, you know, waste another year and a half of your life, and it could be a failure, and, you know, but you're going to have to believe me on this one.、Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people are like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know. And I can understand that because, again, it, it's a, it was a gamble. But then on the other hand, there were, I mean, a lot of us,、um, you know, myself included, but I mean, a lot of people on the team that were like, no, I mean, we worked so hard on this. And we did our jobs the best that we could. Man, it looks a lot night of, and you know, day and different. Some circumstances that were out of our control.、Um, you know, decisions made by higher ups. Unless that was 11. That was 14, that, right? You know, affected our work and nothing that we could do about it. But we had put our all into it and we were invested in the project. And we still believed in the project. To have someone from the outside come in 
and not just come in to say, okay, you know, forget it, we're just going to do it my way or the highway. He's like, he, you know, he asked our opinions, he l laid out a roadmap, he gave us a vision and a hope, and it, even though it seemed like it would be difficult to achieve, it didn't seem inconceivable. Yoshi P knew there was no time to wait. He worked with corporate to make sure the team had time off, both for them to relax, but also to give him time to build his new vision, to do research playing other MMOs, and to help draft his plan to deliver the vision and how the team was going to do it. They had very little time to fix this game, so once they started, the specifications document would have to be watertight. And as captain of the ship, he needed to be able to answer every question the team may have quickly. Yoshida-san was now at the helm of his first Final Fantasy, and as an avid MMO fan, he was looking forward to getting in there and fixing it. What he couldn't have known at this stage was the scale of the job ahead of him, that no matter how much they patched Final Fantasy XIV online, they couldn't ever fix it. What they'd have to do was something Switch that no engines. developer had ever done. Completely to rebuild trash. an entire MMO while the original version was still running. Holy shit! They realized. So, <laughs> they were like, fuck, dude. FF14 is just going to go on and like be a distraction for everybody. And we're just going to fucking rebuild this motherfucker from scratch, low key. That is... Immediately, that it was something that couldn't be solved via patches. I think they still believe that, you know, if we patch it, it'll be fine. Um, and it wasn't until they reevaluated and then brought in, you know, the new blood. Yoshisan came in and told them, okay, yeah, this is not something that can be patched. If we want to fix this, we're going to have to take a drastic step. Damn. Yoshida spent seven weeks researching and returned with two options for corporate. It was then he realized that it would be impossible to convert the current game into an MMO that could last the test of time. Ultimately, though, this was a decision that corporate had to make. So he returned with not one, but two plans. Plan A and Bro, Plan that's B. Bro, the, that's During the ultimate gamble. It's like we just dumped millions of dollars into this game and it failed. And you want to let that game continue so that we can dump millions of dollars into this game, like under the fucking radar, and then pull it out from like, oh, that's crazy. During this meeting, he explained that plan A would be to patch the game and make it more playable, but that ultimately the game would never Fail. really satisfy yeah. players. And yeah. though Square Enix may make their money back, the damage to the online brand would be catastrophic. True. And then there was plan B. Plan B was apply patches to the current version of Final Fantasy XIV, but alongside that... In the background, we would build a completely new Final Fantasy XIV. What? Of course, just listening to those two options, corporate would have been like, what are you talking about? Trying to divide up your team? But I told them also because we had promised our fans that we would release a PlayStation 3 version. We would need to launch this within the life cycle of PlayStation 3. Holy shit. Now you're on a time schedule of like, we need to release this before PlayStation 4 comes out. What? We've never done it before in the games industry. And on top of that, we're releasing it under the same title. Oh I think at least by uh, taking on this challenge, we'd get the fans to realize that Final Fantasy is doing something crazy again or something really great. And they will see our effort in trying to regain their trust and trying to make a good on the damage we had caused to the uh, franchise. So that my presentation to the corporate and I was going to leave it up to them to decide upon option A or B. Dude, that's a crazy choice. We can make your game better and maybe make your money back, but it's going to suck wiener no matter what, and it will ruin your franchise name a little bit. Or a lot of it. Or we can make a fucking whole other game. Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 was in a state of disarray. Square oh Enix had decided goodness, to suspend dude. subscriptions to help ease oh, the negativity around awful. the game. Look at that UI. Look at it. Look at those abilities. Looks like straight cheeks. 
while the PS3 version was indefinitely It barely postponed. looks better than For 11. For the next two years, Yoshida-san and his team would work tirelessly on not one, but two MMOs. Patching the original 1.0 to fans' expectations, while secretly working on a brand new version. Imagine that, dude! You having to, like, appease the fans on this shit MMO. And not able to be like, guys, we are working on some shit. Don't worry. We got this. You know what I mean? You just got to shut the fuck up and, and let it happen, right? That's crazy. Of Final Fantasy XIV. In our next episode, we focus on that two-year period and tell the incredible story of the falling moon of Dalamud, the death of 1.0, and the birth of a new Eorzea. Oh, no shit! Oh, wait, this project, like the YouTube video? Okay, I thought, okay, don't scare me. I was like, what do you mean a patron? All right, anyways, uh, next.